my wife is a sweetheart because she spoils me rotten. Whoa, got an amen over there for that. One of the ways that my wife spoils me rotten is she always gives me control of the remote. Amen, amen to that, brother. She always lets me have the remote. She is, we're in the living room together. Carol's down here shaking her head. She uh, is in the living room and I've, I try to give her the remote sometimes and she says, no, you take it. So uh, uh, unfortunately for her, she's, we're always watching uh, most of the time a sporting event, whether it be football or, or basketball. Uh, sometimes the one thing she does not like to watch is UFC. Now, if you don't know what UFC is, you put two people in a cage, and they fight. Now, I don't know a lot about UFC. But, so when I watch UFC, I'm watching two people, men, uh, beat each other senseless. My wife can't see a whole lot of point in that, and, re and neither really do I. But when you're watching it, and I don't, I'm, I don't know UFC like I know other sports. Uh, you, if I'm watching basketball, I know the players, I know the coaches, uh, if I'm watching football, I know the quarterbacks, the running backs, the wide receivers. But I'm watching UFC, and I don't know who's who. I just know they're in there trying to beat each other. So a lot, oftentimes, there's in the bottom of the screen, it'll say Johnson, red trunks, white trim. It'll say Smith, black, uh, white trunks, blue trim. So now I can tell the difference of who's who. In our text today, this is what John does. John tells us who is who. He gives markers. Ladies, if you're watching football, you say, well, I don't know who the, the Dolphins from the Patriots. Well, the, the Dolphins are wearing the white and the Patriots might be wearing the blue. Here, John gives us a, a differentiation of who a Christian is and who a Christian is not. He gives markers if you will. Now, why would John need to do that? Why would John have to do that? Well, many believe that they are Christians when in fact they are not. Many believe that they are Christians when in fact they are not. Does that statement like rub you, shock you, bother you? Well, according to statistics, there are 2.2 billion professing Christians. However, what I just said is that many believe they're Christians and they're not. Now, why would I say something like that? Well, Matthew chapter number seven. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Strong words, tough words. And yet John the apostle and Jesus does not leave us to wonder if we're on the outside looking in. Is that, is that going to be us? Is that going to be me? In our text today, Jesus calls for a genuine, real faith. And in the process, he identifies three distinguishing marks of true believers. John chapter 12 this morning. We'll begin in verse 36. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still not, did not believe in him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. 
but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on that last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who has sent me has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. What's the first characteristic of a true believer? The first characteristic is a true Christian believes. A true Christian believes. We see this in John 36, verses uh, 36 through 41. He says, while you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. The unbelief of the people, when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. This idea of Jesus pulling back, it's kind of almost like a judgment in and of itself. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world and I'm going to give you a taste of the darkness that's going to be around. I'm going to pull myself back from you. I'm going to withdraw from you. I'm going to take the light away just for a little bit. And in verse 37, John gives a concession. John gives a concession. What was that concession? Well, let's look at verse 37. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So here's Jesus doing all of these signs. And we know the purpose of the signs is that people might believe. He's turned water into wine. He's fed the 5,000. He's healed people's sons. He's healed them. And the signs ultimately point to, if he can do this, then who is this man, Jesus? Signs that were supposed to generate faith had not generated faith. Why? How do we explain that? Well, verse 38 helps us understand why they did not believe. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Then he quotes Isaiah 53, one of the most famous passages in your entire Bible. Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The two phrases I want you to catch there as you look at it on the board is, who has believed what he's heard from us? This is speaking of the words of Jesus. Jesus, who's believed your words? And the arm of the Lord is his works. Jesus' words and his works, they still rejected. They still pushed back. And Isaiah is prophesying here and in Isaiah 6, which we'll see in a moment, that they would not believe. Those are prophecies 700 years ago that the Messiah would be rejected. And therefore, verse 39, therefore, they could not believe. It's not according to John that they wouldn't believe. John says they could not believe. Isaiah had already foreseen that they would not believe. Therefore, they could not believe. Notice Isaiah 5 or 6, 5 through 10. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that had taken from tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am, send me. And he says, And here's God giving direction to Isaiah. Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing 
but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their eyes heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Isaiah was being charged, you go preach and they won't believe, Isaiah. They're not gonna listen to you. Their hearts will be hardened. Go preach. That would be frustrating for a pastor, would it not? Go preach and nobody's going to listen to a word you say. In chapter, John chapter 12, verse 40, he quotes this verse in Isaiah 6. He has blinded their eyes. He has hardened their hearts. Jesus has come. He has preached. He has given the gospel. He's done these great works. And yet people have not believed. If you're sitting here today and you've believed the gospel, when you go to heaven, you will have nothing to boast of. Nothing. You might want to boast, well, I've believed. Then you could have something to boast for. You were never smart enough, wise enough, intelligent enough, or good enough to figure out the gospel. Belief is a supernatural thing. And in order to be a Christian, you must believe. You cannot be a Christian without believing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you've never believed the gospel, you've never believed that you actually need saving, then today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to believe that Christ came, lived the life that you could not live, lived perfectly before a holy God, which you could never do, then died and paid your sin debt, which you owe God, the wages of sin as death, and then validated everything he said or did by raising on the third day. If you've never believed that, I want to encourage you today to believe. On what or whom are you banking your ability to get to heaven? On what or whom are you banking your ability to get to heaven? You say you must believe the gospel if you want to believe a Christian, want to be a Christian. You can't, you can't be good enough. You can't be uh, do enough good things. You must trust Christ today. If one author put it like this, if to believe in Jesus was man's first duty, then not to believe in him was his chief sin. Unbelief in the work of the gospel will send you to an eternity without God. Trust Christ today. So a true Christian believes. Not only does a true Christian believe, but a true Christian confesses. A true Christian confesses, verse 41. Isaiah said these things because he saw whose glory? His glory, Jesus' glory. And he spoke of him. Verse 42. Nevertheless, even though some didn't believe, many even of the authorities believed in him. Some don't believe, some do believe. That's the good news. But he puts this little word in here, but. Now they've believed, but. He adds this phrase, for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. They believed. That's the first part, they believed. Yes, they believed. But the second mark was not present, confessing. Why not? They feared the Pharisees. They feared the religious leaders of the day. They did not, the last phrase says, they did not want to be put out of the synagogue. They would lose their religious and social privileges. They might be looked upon a little bit different in, even in society if they believed. We see this in John 7, 13. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. They I'm going to believe, but I, I really don't want to be labeled a Jesus freak. I, I don't want to be looked at funny, if you will. 
John 5, 44 gives the same story. Jesus says, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes only from God? They were concerned about what man thought of their profession. What will somebody say? Well, verse 43 carries the same idea. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Ultimately, they did not value God. They valued what man thought about them. So they wouldn't confess it. The second group of people believed. They, they believed, but they, wouldn't, <clears throat> they would not confess. Their love for human praise drowned out their love for divine praise, and they kept their mouth quiet. John is confronting an error then and an error now. And the error is, I follow Jesus, but it's really a private faith. It's a, it's a me and Jesus faith. And I'm not really going to talk about it, say anything about my faith. I'm going to keep it kind of private. John says, no, 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 no. You must be willing to confess your faith, even if it makes you look a little bit awkward. These people, these people that have believed, they were okay with Jesus, even rejoiced in Jesus, as long as it didn't cost them anything socially in their life. I'll follow Jesus, but really no farther. I'll pray to you, maybe even acknowledge you, but not in a way that people will think I'm a, I'm a Jesus freak or that I'm a little awkward. Many of us have come to this same pressure. Oh, we, we believe, but are we willing to confess? We don't just believe, we must confess. You see, saving faith, real faith, is publicly confessed no matter what the circumstances may be. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. You see, John and Paul leave no room for a private faith. They go together. It's not just believing. It's believing and confessing. John and Paul are emphasizing. This is why we have a baptistry. This is the first step of your public profession of Christ. If you're here today and you've never been baptized, I want to ask you this question. What's the reason biblically that you've never been baptized? What's the reason you've never publicly, demonstrably said, I have believed and trusted Christ? Today's a great day to come forward and go, I've never been baptized, but I want to publicly confess today that I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. It would be like I wear this wedding band. I've wore it every day uh, since the day I got married. What, what would Rebecca say if I took this wedding band off and I just took it off? Now, I don't know how long it would take her to notice. Let's play a game today. I'll take it off and see if she notices. I wouldn't. I wouldn't either, Leonard. But you know what this, you know what this wedding band is? This wedding band doesn't make me married. It just demonstrates that I am married. See, that's what baptism is. It's a symbol going, yes, I have placed my faith and trust in Christ and I want to show my whole church. I want to show my whole, whole community. But much like this wedding ring, it, this wedding ring isn't just a one-time thing. I don't, on June 7th, 1997, the I didn't slip, she didn't slip it on my finger and go, shoot, one time act, glad that's over, and then take it back off. See, after this one time act of baptism, then we live every day publicly confessing Christ to others. Now, should every conversation we have with our coworkers or our loved ones be about Jesus? No. But I'll gently yet forcefully say, if your coworkers have no idea you're a Christian, that could be a problem. Because you may not be willing to publicly profess him before men. 
And what did Jesus say about that? If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. Strong words from our Savior. We should be opening our mouth and speaking of Christ. Saving faith is publicly expressed. So a true Christian believes, a true Christian confesses, and a true Christian follows. True Christian follows. This is where it gets even more difficult. Verse 44, Jesus cried out and says, whoever believes in me believes not in me, but him who sent me. Really relying upon Jesus is relying upon the Father. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father, Jesus is saying. In verse 46, if you don't have verse 46 underlined in your Bible, it's a great verse because it, it summarizes the whole purpose of, for Jesus coming. I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Turn, turn on the news. You were watching the news the other night. I was fixed to Fox News the other night. The Paris shootings that broke out. 130 plus dead, 350 injured. I don't think you have a leg to stand on when you say those, this world that we're living in is not a darkened, broken world. It is. There's no, there's no spark of goodness in man that he can tap into. We're all broken, flawed people. Some just display it more than others. We saw it this week displayed in mass shootings and mass murder but what did Jesus do he came into this world of brokenness to save us and pull us out and make us sons and daughters of light he died so that we could be sons and daughters of light and once our response to Jesus doing this to dying on the cross it's believe whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. We wholly rely on Jesus. And when we do, verse 50 says, we have the promise of eternal life. But is it just belief that Jesus is looking for? Is it just belief that he expects? I say no, he doesn't just expect faith. Let's look at verse 47. If anyone hears my word and does not, it doesn't say does not believe them. No, it says if anyone hears my word and does not keep them. What does that word keep there mean? Anyone who hears my word and does not obey them. Your children, when you are rearing them, they they naturally rub against that obedience. Stop it. No. Children don't like people over them. Here Jesus is saying, look, if you've heard me and believe me, but you don't keep them, that's going to be a problem for you down the road. Verse 48 the one who receives me and does not receive or keep my words, oh, you've got to judge. And the word that I have spoken will judge him on that last day. She says, I didn't come to judge you now, but if you don't keep my words, you don't heed my words, you don't obey my words, you will face judgment one day. Because they're not really my words, they're his words. So it's not just believing, not just confessing, but it's keeping and receiving according to verse 47 and 48. It's a faith that demonstrates itself by its obedience to that faith. Wives, has your husband ever had a fix-it job around the house? And he's working on that job 
And wife, you've gone up to him and you've said, look, I see how you're attacking that problem there. It's not going to work. And the wife has said, you need to do it this way. X, Y, and Z. And the husband in his mind goes, honey, you ain't got a clue. And you do it your way and it breaks. And it don't work. And the wife comes back along and says, you didn't listen to a word I said, did you? Did you really believe her? No, you did not. Because you did not keep her words. You did not heed her words. The same is the case for many professing Christians. I believe Jesus. I may even be baptized and confess it. But to really do what he says, to really be a disciple, come on now, pastor. You see, this is an error to say I'm a Christian, but I'm not really a disciple. I'm not really going to listen to what he says to do. I believe in Jesus, but I don't follow him. You see, to believe someone is to take someone at their word. Husbands, when you take your wife's word, you're going to do what she says to do it that way. You're going to do it because you're going to believe in her and believe in her words. That's Jesus' point. Believe, hear, keep, don't reject, receive. Many profess to be Christians, but live with a complete disregard for his word. I believe I can say this with authority. They can make no claim on Christ. No claim on Christ. Now it's easy to spot when this disobedience, when someone commits a big sin, murder, adultery, theft, but what about those small sins of our heart where we walk around unthankful all the time or angry all the time or bitter all the time? Are we keeping his word? Are we receiving his word? Saving faith is always, 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 always demonstrated by an imperfect obedience. Martin Luther said this, we are saved by faith alone. But the faith that saves is never alone. Let me say that again. We are saved by faith alone. But the faith that saves is never alone. Saving faith is accompanied by hearing, receiving, and keeping Jesus' words. Now here's the question maybe you're asking. Then how much obedience is enough? Because we're imperfect. We're going to sin. We're going to fall down. Exactly. The key is not how much am I, am I obeying, it's how much am I repenting. How much am I repenting? Let me illustrate it like this. There was a father who had to be somewhere. He had a flight leaving. He had to get to the, had to get to the airport. And you know, today you had to get, you've got to get to the airport earlier. And it had rained the day before and his little toddler son was outside in the grass playing in the mud and man he was just covered in mud he was having a time playing in the mud he didn't have anywhere to be and he was full of joy playing in the mud covered in mud and as the father was walking uh, out to leave that that morning he saw his son in the mud and got a smile on his face and then he slipped in the mud walking across the yard and fell in the mud and now he was covered in the mud but he was different than a son why he had somewhere he had to be he had to be at the airport. So you know what the father had to do? He had to get up, rush back in the house, change clothes, get on new clothes, walk back out the door, make sure he didn't slip and fall, get in the car and get to the airport on time. See, that's repentance. It's when you fall down and you get muddy. You don't stay in the mud. You get up. You acknowledge that you had fallen in the mud and you, then you press toward the calling of Christ, which is the keeping of his word. 
And if the father were to fall down again before he got to the car, you know what he'd do? He would get up and go back in the house and get redressed again. You cannot be a Christian and stay in the mud and be happy with it. Be content with it. No, I'm good right here. That's not a Christian. I don't care if you've believed. I don't care if you've confessed. If you're not repenting, you are not a believer. You see, this remorse and repentance that we have is a sign that God is at work within us. It's, it's good. Let me finish the sentence before you freak out. It's good that we sin and we're remorseful about it. We're repenting, repenting about it. Oh God, I don't want to do that again. I want to get up and move forward. I want to follow Christ. I want to follow Christ in his precepts. I want to keep his word. That's my heart's desire. Michael Horton says this, that holiness is not an option. It's a requirement. This is not a threat. It's a promise. The good news is what God began, he will finish. In Christ, we are already holy, righteous, sanctified, and reconciled. Now we are called to live what we are, not to become what we are not yet. Are you keeping his words? And are you repenting when you don't? Look, we are going to obey imperfectly. We will. We will obey imperfectly. But God wants us to keep repenting so that we're striving after, chasing after this obedience. Have you believed today? Have you trusted Christ today? Or are you trusting something other than Christ today? You're trusting in being a good person, being a nice person, being kind to your coworkers, being better than your coworkers. Being better than your coworkers will not get you to heaven. Have you confessed? Have you been baptized? Are you willing to share the gospel? Talk about Jesus with your loved one, with your, with your neighbor, to talk about Christ? And I'm not going to ask you if you're obeying. I'm going to ask you if you're repenting. Are you repenting? Are you wiping off that mud every time you fall down? Oh, Lord, help me. Oh, Jesus, I, I failed today. And, oh, Lord, are you a repenting person? If you haven't come to Christ, I beg you today, come to Christ. Believe in this Jesus that is your only hope for eternal life. Let's bow in prayer. As the musicians come, where are you at today? Maybe, you're, maybe you've believed, but you've never confessed. You've never been baptized, and you want to be baptized. You want to publicly confess to Barbers Grove Baptist Church in Stanley County. I need to be baptized. I've trusted Christ, but I want to be baptized. Maybe you struggle with sharing your faith, and you've been a little ashamed what people may think. Maybe you need to come ask forgiveness for that. Maybe you want to share your faith more effectively and not be concerned about what people think. Maybe you, you send your life a need to, to quickly repent, not stay in the mud, but to be quick to repent of that sin, to strive after the words of Christ and follow after him. What's your need today? I want to urge you to come forward today. If, you've, if you're not a Christian today, come and receive Christ. Come and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only way to eternal life. Father, take your word and my feeble attempt to present it. May it take root in hearts. May the challenge of Christ confront us. If there's one here that has not believed, Father, would you do your grand and glorious work and draw them to yourself? Father, if there's one here today that has not been baptized or struggles in sharing their faith, Lord, would you do a work in their heart as well? 
Father, maybe there's someone here that's living in the mud. They're living in the mud and they haven't repented. And you've, you've pricked their heart to repent, to get up out of the mud and follow after your word. Father, have your will and way here today. In Christ's name I pray, amen.